But uh, now I have, I think, the most fun part of my job tonight is to start introducing our uh, speakers. And uh, the first one will be uh, Professor Daniel Weinstock, and I can call him Professor because he talked to me <laughs> at UDM it was, uh, some 15 years ago. Uh, yeah. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Um, Professor Weinstock is well known, I think, uh, as a public figure involved in many different debates. He's an ethicist and philosopher now at McGill University, he was previously a professor at the Department of Philosophy at the uh, Université de Montréal and led the Centre de Recherche en Éthique at the Université de Montréal, CRIM, for a long time, was founding director, I believe, yes, and is now leading another institute at McGill, the Institute of Health and Social Policy. He has published work uh, on a wide range of ethical issues and uh, public policy in the area of health, education, multiculturalism, to name but a few of his areas of interest. He was also the founding director of Quebec's Public Health Ethics Committee and a member of the advisory committee of the Bouchard-Taylor Commission. Uh, more recently, he was a co-author of a report by the Royal uh, Society of Canada on end-of-life decision-making. Uh, which, uh, which the content of was uh, picked up in Quebec and other provinces and international. So we're really delighted to have you with us and uh, to speak uh, from a ethicist and philosopher standpoint to the issue. So uh, thanks. Merci beaucoup, Eric. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to start by uh, doing a, an experiment. Uh, this was not uh, programmed, and maybe it's a little bit risky. Um, I want to ask everybody. Uh, I want to ask everybody to raise your right hand. Thank you very much. So, what just happened? Uh, one of the questions that philosophers like asking themselves is: When you did that, uh, what was going through your mind? Were you free? Were you aware of perhaps there being an alternative? To put it in the terms of the question that philosophers like to ask themselves, could you have acted otherwise? Right? Could you have acted otherwise? That wasn't, a qu that wasn't actually a question we'll, we'll be talking later. So, my role here is to um, sort of give a broad sketch of the way in which philosophers have thought about the issue, which really, you know, one way of looking at the, neuro the uh, 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 neuroscience is basically is posing chapter 2463 of a book that's been written in the history of philosophy for hundreds and even thousands of years now, which is the issue of free will. So there's a very strong conception that we have of ourselves. I'm sure that when I said, raise your right hand, you all kind of did it without thinking. Here's an authority figure, he's on a podium, he's a professor, he's got a PhD next to his name. Um, and there probably wasn't very much going through your mind. I didn't see anybody thinking, hmm, you know, what's he getting at? Uh, it was pretty automatic. But as you retell the story to yourselves uh, about what was going on, when I did sort of ask the question, I heard a lot of yeses out there. The thing that occurs to you is, um, well, after all, I'm a free agent. I have free will, right? Um, and uh, this is central to the conception that human beings uh, have of themselves, which is that their decisions are essentially the result of processes that depend upon them and not upon anything else uh, in the world. Now, the issue of freedom is made particularly difficult by the fact that we live in a world that is shot through uh, by processes of causality. My favorite philosopher uh, is a Scottish philosopher uh, of the 18th century by the name of David Hume. And he has an illustration uh, to uh, just illustrate caus causality, which is basically two billiard balls. Right? Two billiard balls. He thinks that the image of a billiard ball striking another billiard ball, impressing its velocity and its uh, you know, direction upon the second billiard ball, is a pretty good image to think about the causality that permeates the world, right? including human beings within the world. There is matter, and all matter is subject to causal regularities. Hume didn't talk about laws, right? Causal regularities. We see one thing happen, then another thing happens, and we say, well, these things are related uh, by, by some kind of relationship of causality. And this is the way that everything works uh, in the world. Human beings not accepted, right? Human beings are not somehow immunized 
from this idea that uh, everything is matter and that matter's behavior is determined by causal relationships. Okay? Now, what is the problem with viewing our um, selves as um, caught up in causal relationships while still wanting to retain the image that we are free? Well, there's this idea that poses a little bit of a problem, right? Very, very closely linked with our idea that we are free, there is the idea that we have something that we refer to as a self, right? So when you think back to that little experiment that we did a few uh, minutes ago, right, you think that somewhere inside where it's located, not clear. People used to think that it was around the heart. And now, as we get uh, sort of into the era of neuroscience, we tend to think that it's in the head, right? There's something like a steerer or a driver. Sure, we say, right? We have brains, and our brains have something to do with uh, how it is that we behave, but somewhere behind the brain, in the brain, above the brain, we're not sure exactly what. There is a self doing the steering. We have a lot of trouble getting away from the idea that freedom and the self are not somehow intrinsically connected. How can we have freedom if we don't have a driver steering this lump of meat that we all are? Right? So imagine a car, right? And imagine that I tried to uh, sort of convince you that human beings are sort of like cars. They have complex mechanisms that propel them and that give them direction. You would immediately want to stick a driver in the car uh, in order to explain a lot of things. And that driver is kind of like the self. So the challenge is how do we come up with a vision of ourselves as being free, right? Caught up in relationships of causality. Uh, but with this idea of self, of the self, of somehow there being, to use an expression that was used by a famous philosopher of the 20th century, a ghost in the machine. You know, here's this machine, and somehow there's a ghost in it doing the work of steering us in certain directions rather than uh, others. So, through history, the idea of the self has seemed to be difficult to connect with the idea of a thoroughgoing causality, right? The self is not something that can be accounted for in material terms, right? If everything is matter, then where is the self in this world of matter and causal relationships between material beings? And so if there's been a temptation throughout the history of philosophy to revert to something called dualism. So dualism is the idea that despite appearances, <coughs> despite the picture that I painted by referring to the philosopher, the Scottish philosopher David Hume, there actually are two levels of existence. There is the matter that we observe, right, that is inert, that is somehow dumb, that doesn't have any self-steering capacity, and then there is some kind of spiritual substance, right, that is unobservable, unquantifiable, right, but that we need to assume in order to give an account of the self. Right? So if we suppose that we have some kind of a self that is steering these bodies that we have, right? and if we have trouble accounting for this self in purely material terms, what we're going to do is we're going to reach for various dualist accounts. Right? The idea is that there is matter, but there is also something else that is guiding the matter that, we, that our bodies have. I would say that a lot of the challenge of the philosophy of the modern period, the modern period where on the one hand we are convinced by a lot of the uh, realizations, a lot of the accomplishments uh, of science, but we have a hard time getting rid right, of this dualism. We have a hard time getting rid of this idea that even if we don't belong, believe in souls anymore, like uh, religious thinkers did, and like even a thinker like René Descartes did, even if we don't believe in souls anymore, we have a hard time thinking of the relationship of our self to our bodies, our self to the matter that makes up our bodies, in ways that don't end up sounding almost as if we still believed in the souls that René Descartes talked about and that a lot of religious uh, thinkers talked about. So, so far I've put up on the, uh, on the board um, sort of words that 
pretty, that probably have a resonance with all of you. We all have a sense of what freedom means, although if I pushed you, you probably would realize that your conception of what freedom is uh, is a little bit more sort of mixed up than, uh, than you thought it was. Self, everybody kind of understands. Now I'm going to put up a word which is the only kind of technical word that I'm going to use in my whole presentation, which is compatibilism. Now, compatibilism is a technical word, but if you look at the etymology, it's pretty clear what it means, right? The challenge of modern philosophy, of the philosophy of the post-scientific revolution era, is to try to make the belief that we have in ourselves as selves, the belief that we have in ourselves as free beings, compatible with the truth that there is really only matter um, and causal relationships between material things that make up the world in which we live. Now, one of the things, and this is the challenge that I, in a way, like to pose perhaps to uh, the speakers that are going to uh, come after me, who know far more about uh, neuroscience uh, than I do, which is lucky because uh, I know uh, very little, is to say that some of the ways in which neuroscientists have posed the challenge which neuroscience represents for our traditional conceptions still end up trapped in the dualistic picture that I painted. So remember, um, uh, Eric very helpfully put up those three, that, that quote, right? That quote where he uh, uh, referred to an experiment that was done uh, uh, somewhere with brain imaging where they realized that seven seconds before a person was conscious of having made a decision, there were patterns in the brain, right? That suggested that some causal process leading up to the decision had already been made. Now, the conclusion that he takes away from that, I think, according to the terms that you put up on the board after, might be thought of as revolutionary. Once we take this into account, we realize that there really is no self doing any real work. It's all being done by processes uh, which uh, have nothing to do with our consciousness, have nothing to do with ourselves as uh, free beings. The orange light has just gone on. I was, I was very sort of aware of this uh, light system going on here, and that means that I'm going to have to uh, wrap up uh, fairly soon. So the implications that one, I think, very quickly takes from uh, neuroscience and from all kinds of other scientific discoveries about the nature of human agency in the past tend to be revolutionary. If this is true, if the brain is really making our decisions before we're even conscious of them, Right? How could it be anything else but a revolution in our way of thinking about the self? Right? Because remember, the self requires that, as you were when you raised your hand, there be a ghost in the machine doing the work. There be a self engineering the different ways in which your body moves in space. So the challenge, I think, is to reconceptualize the question. Right? I think that what we have to come to realize is that what needs to be explained right, is human beings and their behavior, but also their sense of themselves as being free. Our sense of freedom, our conception that we are making decisions, and that when we are making decisions, we are sensitive to something called reasons. If you were to tell the story back to yourself about what happened at the beginning of my presentation, you would say, well, I came here to uh, hear a presentation. The speaker wanted me to raise my hand because he probably had a point. He's got a PhD. In deciding to raise your hands, you were sensitive to the reasons that you had to raise your hands, which included all of the things that I've just mentioned. Now, that sensitivity to reasons, the fact that we are beings who have this complicated ability right, to respond to the reasons that there are around us, to act in certain ways rather than others, these are not things that transcend nature, these are parts of nature. Right? We have to give ourselves an account of the natural beings that we are that includes our capacity to be responsive to reasons. And the challenge that is thrown out, I think, to neuroscience is not to keep on uh, sort of uh, perpetuating the dualist myth, the idea that there is the brain on the one hand and then there is our sense of self on the other that has to be explained away once we take the truth of neuroscience for granted. I think the challenge that is before neuroscience, and it's a challenge that I think it will take up, is how to explain neuroscientifically in a way that doesn't debunk but validates the very natural fact that we are beings who are responsive to reasons. So, um, 
that's a way of, I guess, opening up the discussion for the people who know a lot more about neuroscience than I do. And uh, I hope that uh, we'll have a chance to uh, uh, discuss some of these sort of heavier philosophical issues in the question period. But I think I'm going to pass it back over to Eric. Thank you. So, um, what I'm going to do is quickly summarize in French. Uh, that's, a, that's a big job. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Donc, um, Professeur Van Stock nous a expliqué comment euh, l'interprétation qu'on fait des, des connaissances neuroscientifiques, quand euh, on croit qu'elles mettent en péril le libre arbitre, ou free will, sont en fait euh, peut-être basées sur une conception un peu euh, simplifiée. Euh, de l'interprétation des neurosciences parce que c'est comme si finalement on euh, adhérait à une vision dualiste et qu'on dit mais finalement on présuppose déjà qu'il y a quelque chose comme un, un élément physique un élément euh, de l'esprit puis donc si on n'en trouve pas euh, c'est que les neurosciences vont euh, comme on dit en anglais explain the way, ils vont l'éliminer mais en fait euh, ce que le professeur Van Stock explique c'est qu'il faut reconnaître l'existence de ce phénomène là puis le travail des neurosciences c'est davantage de l'expliquer en gros? Parfait. Euh, Est-ce que j'ai eu un plus dans le cours? Euh, je m'en souviens pas. Euh, je vais peut-être une chance de me reprendre. 